Well, uh, I'm glad you guys are here this morning again. My name is uh, Andrew Pastor at uh, Cap City Church, and uh, we're starting our series, A uh, Power for Life. And so this is going to be a three-part series. We've been, we've been, Pastor and I have been talking a little bit and praying, okay, God, what, what do you want us to do for Father's Day? It, it settles right in the middle of our uh, right in the middle of our series. So we'll see if we do three straight weeks of Power for Life, uh, or if, uh, if Father's Day we do something a little special message. But um, in, in, any, in any way, we're, we're going to believe, we're going to be studying on the Holy Spirit this month and believe that God's going to do something great. I don't know about you guys, I was I was just uh, doing some work. At, I work at Managed Little Courier Box on the side, and, and so I was I was doing some ordering this week, and I was going on the thing, and on the ordering sheet, I have to put on the date for when it's going to be delivered, and I put on the date for June, and I put six on, you know, six one is when it was going to be delivered, and I was like, the year is halfway over. Oh, I mean, I guess, I guess after June, that would be six months, but we could come to five. It's like almost halfway over already. So I don't know how, how your guys' year has been. Anybody have a really awesome year, They're like this celebratory year, this is a great year? Anybody have like a year that's kind of like, oh, I don't know, it's like halfway over? Like, I, I, I had some goals, and I, I haven't set those goals yet, I got some things I wanted to see, and I, I thought, this is going to be the year, I did it! I started off that year too, it's like, this is going to be the year I exercise. I know, normally don't do the, uh, the, the reunion, I mean the uh, resolution things at New Year's. I, I try not to do that. I'm like, all right, cool, I'll just do my thing. This year I was like, you know what? I start working out every day. I think it lasted for about 20 days. And then I got sick, and then I haven't done it yet. Yeah, I'm like, ah, come on. But uh, um, this is the year. I don't know how your year's done, but it, it's, now, it's now six months in. I don't know if it, when you're a kid, I've, I've been you know, learning some different things about child raising children. Rachel and I are getting ready to adopt, so, so we've been taking some classes and some courses and some studying. They've had us take, I think, um, we're up to like 32 hours now of different studies and things and learning. Uh, and so I, I also heard Rachel's been nanny for a little bit, and the, we got a lot of little babies around the, the place, and so they got like little three-month checkups, right? And then six-month checkups, they get their shot weekend. So some of the kids they get their shots at six months, and they're all sad, and they're all, you know, sick. But the, we're believing, uh, like I said, this month is going to be like our six-month checkup. When they are here, we're going, to, we're going to come to the doctor, daddy, doctor, father, God, and say, all right, check us out. Give us some shots. Give us some boosters. Because uh, because this is the month. It's halfway over for the year, and I want, I want to see some things. I want to see some miracles. I want to stop. Uh, I don't want to stop praying for miracles, but I want to stop praying and not hearing answers. I, I want to stop praying that the seats will be full and that and that uh, people will come to know Jesus. I, I, I want to stop just praying it. I want to start seeing it. Amen. And so I said, all right, I'm going to have to get out of my mind, go crazy. And the pastor said, we all need to go crazy. No, I didn't say that. But when I get out of my mind, I was trying to figure it out, trying to like all the diagrams and just say, okay, Holy Spirit, what do you want? Holy Spirit, show up. Holy Spirit, show your power. Holy Spirit, I know when I rely on you, I get you, right? But when I rely on myself, I get me. I mean, I, I'm tired of getting me. I, I'm ready to get God. Anybody else want to join me? In my life, say, in my life, I want to get God. I want to have some God. I want to have the Holy Spirit. And we're praying that this is what it's going to be. So when we look at the Scripture, we see in the book of Acts, it had another. It was another moment like this, another transition moment that, that the book of Acts starts with. Jesus, the disciples, they're with them, uh, they're with them 24-7, they're living with them, they're seeing miracles, they're seeing all these things happen, and then there's a tra transition period happening after Jesus raised from the dead, he, he gets, with the, gets with all the disciples, and for 40 days it says in the book of Acts that he talked about the kingdom. And I don't know about you guys, whenever I think about the kingdom, whenever I think about the he heaven and, and what it's going to be like, I get excited. Like, I want it now. Like I was talking about in my prayer, right? We look around the world, we see all the chaos, we see all the turmoil, and we say, oh, the kingdom looks like peace. That sounds good right about now. I want some of that, right? And this is what was happening um, as, we, as we read through the book of Acts. We'll see this transition that's happening. There were times when they were with Jesus, and then it's a transition, it's getting ready, and he's talking about the kingdom, he's excited about the kingdom. And the disciples, they, they were like, wanting this. They're desiring it. I'm telling you, anything in your life that you want to go for spiritually, 
This is the key. The key to growing spiritually is desire, is a want. I'm tired of the status quo. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of this year the way it's gone. I, I, I'm ready for it. If you, you have to have that moment in your heart that says, I'm ready for it. I want it. It's going to happen. And the disciples, they were excited about this. They said, man, Jesus, you're talking about all this kingdom stuff. I, I really want it. I, I want to see the future come. I want to see all these things happen. And they followed him with hopes that he would fulfill these things now. As they're walking with them, they had this desire in their hearts, and maybe we'll, we'll find a little bit they had the wrong desire. They wanted all these things to happen now. Jesus, you're going to you're going to establish, you're going to make things better now. You're going to you're going to demolish the Roman Empire. You're going to you're going to set up your kingdom, and the, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, we're going to rule and reign. It's going to be awesome, right? <laughs> they were expecting the Messiah would come and establish the kingdom of God on earth, and He would establish the rulership of Israel on earth. They expected that was what Jesus wanted to do. That he would elevate them. And, and you know, there was even time that they were arguing. When, Jesus, when you take your throne, uh, who's going to sit on your right hand? Can I sit on your right hand? Can my brother sit on your left hand? And we'll just rule this thing together. And I think it's funny because I think that's the way God interacts with us sometimes. It's like, you guys just don't quite get it yet. But, all right, all right, let me walk with you. If you walk with them for a little bit longer. But Jesus' messianic fulfillment, his coming to be king over everything, was really, it was their hopes that basically God would fix every broken stuff in their lives. And I think as we, we examine this year, we examine our lives, I think that's the same desire we have. God, would you come and break, uh, fix every broken thing in my life? Man, would you make all my relationships whole? Would you make all, all, all of my neighborhood, would you make it whole? God, would you bring healing here? God, would you bring the jobs that's looking? God, would you bring peace how did you fix all the broken stuff? I think we can relate to that, right? Relationships. Man, if all, all my bills were paid, I mean, if I was getting a promotion somewhere, right? I mean, if, if everything would be happening. If, if, if I had increased favor with all of my families and the solution, if I, if I had increased favor, in, I mean, this is what they wanted. And, it's, and they asked this question. And as Jesus talked about the kingdom, all these wonderful things, they asked this question. Lord, in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, after Acts chapter 1, verse 6, this is what the disciples asked. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They're so excited about it, they're like, it's going to happen now. And this, and, and this is the thought that they had. Everything that's broken in their life, now Jesus is going to fix it because he's risen from the dead, he beat death, and certainly, man, he could fix planet Earth. He could fix some governments, he could fix some people, he could fix some racism issues. I mean, he, he could fix these things. They ask them this question. They're standing there with Jesus in his resurrection form. They say, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Is this the time you're going to make everything how it's supposed to be? And this is what we've been longing for. I mean, for 300 years, there was silence, and all of a sudden, he shows up on the scene. Man, this, is, this has to be the moment. And Jesus responds to them in a peculiar way, maybe to, to you and me, but I think as we pause and we examine this, we'll, we'll, we'll find out how great the answer is. But in Acts chapter 1, and following in verse 7 and 8, he responds to them this way. It's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You're like, wait up, hold up. Is it a, Jesus said, and they asked him, is it going to be now? And then he says, he responds with, it's not for you to know. I confessed already a few sermons ago that, you know, I like to plan things out. I like to strategize about the future. I like to figure things out. Uh, and that's, like, that's kind of my, my mode, uh, what I love to do. But, and, but Jesus says, it's not for you to know. James, remember James? James telling us, don't plan for a profit in the future. Because you don't even know, you can't even control tomorrow. Just, just stay with today. But let's pause here. It's not for you to know this, that he said. And, and they're, they're like, but is it the time? I mean, this is good for me to know. If this is the time, to just tell me. Then now is the time. Now is the, how are you going to do it? I want, I want to figure this out. Is this the moment? Is this the, is this the future? That, and he says, it's not for you to know. The time or the date the Father has said. By his authority. 
Let me just uh, encourage you in a moment, and let me just say, whenever you seek God for answers about the future, He very rarely lets you in on what's coming. He basically says, uh, okay, you're thinking about 2007, you're you thinking about your future, you think about all these, these issues you have, you think about all these things going on around you, well, it's not for you to know when or the hows, what's about to happen in your future. You know why? Why would he, why would he say this to us? Even this morning, as we're asking, God, what's going to happen? What's gonna... Why would he say to us, it's not for you to know? Because if you knew, it wouldn't make it better. It would actually make it worse. You think, but I really want to know, because God, God, you, you can do it. You can tell me. You can show me. Right? I, I really want to know. But if you would just share with me what you have planned and how it's going to work and the challenges and the solutions to the various things that are going on around me, this is going to happen or that's going to happen, then I could really advise you. We could be a team, God, right? We want to tell God what to do. God, God, you could just tell me and then we can do it together. We could, we're in this. We're a team. But God isn't that way. God is the one that's in control. He is the sovereign king. God doesn't tell us the specifics, he gives us, and he doesn't give us the details, because he loves us too much to do that. Some of you are like, what do you mean, Andrew? This is all I mean, supposed to give some advice. This isn't how I thought about God. But oh, he, he loves us enough that he, he doesn't do that to us. If we knew it was going to be coming ahead, I know some of you in this room. I know myself. If I knew it was coming ahead, sometimes it would fill me with anxiety. Mm -hmm. Oh man, this is going to I don't know what I'm going to do there. This is going to happen. I don't know. What? I don't have it in me. God, you really think I can handle that? And then I'd be worried the whole time. More information would not exactly give us peace. More information doesn't always equal peace. I mean, the Google searching what illnesses I have. I got back from... Um, Mexico last weekend, uh, we had a great 10 year anniversary trip, and I've had a bug all week, for, it's been six days of bug. Uh, and you know, you go, you go on the Google, and you can go on WebMD, right, and look up all the symptoms you have, and then it would worry you! <laughs> I got this pain, I got this happening, this happening, ah, you have these major sicknesses, you better see a doctor today, right? I mean, more information isn't exactly offering us peace. It would make you more worried about the stuff that is yet to come. You would start to try to develop solutions on your own and stuff on your own way to, to see how it would happen. Let's be straight, right? If we had the whole plan, we'd probably mess it up too. Yeah. And Sometimes you get a recipe, anybody like to cook, you get a recipe, you got that one, two, three, four step, and the steps are all laid out there, but still somehow in the end they still get messed up. I don't know how it happened, I'm baking. Come down and laughing over here. This is great. Mom and daughter laughing. This is perfect. You would get completely in God's way. And that's why He hasn't told you the plan. He wants you to wait so that He can handle it with you as it comes alone. He wants you to wait so that He can handle it with you as it comes along, as we journey. He's there with us. The source is with us. Some of you think, no, I can handle it better than that. I, no, 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 I, I can do it. I can do it better. I can, I can do it. I, trust me. You don't know how well I planned. If I had some in, insight on the future, it would go well. Trust me. No. No. It wouldn't. You need to wait because knowing the specifics about the future isn't going to make you have peace. In fact, here's what you said. Here's what Jesus said. Right, he said, it's not for you to know, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. It's about the journey. It's about the going. You will receive this power to be my witnesses through it all. Through everything you go through in life, you have power to be a witness for Christ. Now the word witness means that the disciples were supposed to be witnesses to what they had seen, that Jesus was alive, that he was still alive today, that he wanted them to demonstrate himself in the world. So the power of the Holy Spirit gives us the capacity to do that, to demonstrate. If you think, 
You know, there was a whole saying when I was in high school, I used to wear bracelets and everything, what would Jesus do? But in, in your mind's eye, think about it, what would Jesus do in this? How would he act? How would he respond to this situation? That's what the Holy Spirit gives us power to do. And then like we said earlier, think about your hero in your life. And I said, I challenge you to put Jesus as the hero of your life. Jesus, you are so great. You are so awesome. And he says, actually, I want you to be that. The Holy Spirit gives us power to be like Jesus in every situation in our life. I want to encourage you, if you I want you to catch this, that confidence comes not from knowing the specifics about the future. Confidence in the Christian life it doesn't come from knowing the specifics about the future. It comes from knowing the source. Catch that. Get that in your spirit. It doesn't come from knowing the future. It comes from knowing the source. Who to go to. Where to find strength. Whatever you face. Because we know that there's something going to happen. There's something in life that's going to come up. There's some kind of thing in our life that isn't fully God yet. And when it happens, we go to the source. We go to the one who's with us. We go to the power source. It's still not going to be, if you're still not going to be up to the challenge, I, you have to admit, I, I can't do it, but I have the source. He's with me. He gives me the power to do it. Whatever happens to you, whatever happens, or whatever happens, whenever it happens, if you know who to go to, if you have a relationship with God of the universe, who you know is on your side, if you are living in the relationship with the Holy Spirit, there is a source of wisdom, there's a source of life, there's a source of grace, there's a source of power that you can live out. And it's better to know the source than it is know the specifics. The very thing that will give you peace is not to have more understanding of the situation, it's not to know what's going to happen next. It's about knowing the one that will be there no matter what you face. No matter what I face, he's with me. That power is there. We've got to know the source. We have to know the source. I've got to know the source. I can't lead the people of God without knowing the source. You can't live life. I can't live life. I can't manage curry in the box on my own. I can't do it. I can't be married. I can't love my spouse without Knowing the source. Specifics won't help us. It'll just make us more anxious. I think there's a tendency, uh, especially in our generation, in our time period, that, that we want to undervalue our need for the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm talking to a lot of different people on a lot of different levels of, uh, of their relation with God. Some of us are just starting now. Some of us have been seasoned veterans. Some of us know what it's like to depend on the Holy Spirit, to see Him come through. Some of us, uh, maybe in this room, can remember a time when we were dependent on Him, and now maybe we've, we've gone away. But we know what it's like to be with Him. Some of us may have no idea. We have a tendency, however, to undervalue our need for the Spirit. We often live out of our own strength when we face challenges. We try to solve them, striving and worrying and manipulating things to make things happen. We forgot how much we need the Holy Spirit to work in our life. And if I started with a confession this morning, I, I, I would say it again. I, I, have, I have tried, I have forgotten how powerful it is to lean into the Holy Spirit. But this is what Jesus says to his disciples in Acts chapter 1, 4, and 5. And I remember at this point, they had already seen miracles. They had already done miracles. They already went out preaching already. But Jesus says this to them in Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized in water, but in a few days he will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Jesus knew this before he left earth, that his disciples would not be able to do everything on their own. He said, don't go into the future, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait. Right, everybody say it with me. Wait. Wait. Wait for the gift my Father has promised. Here's what he's saying. Look, if you're trying to go out and do the things that I've called you to do in the future, you do it in your own strength and you do it in your own efforts and your own understanding, you're never going to reach the destination that I have planned for you. So he says, wait. Make some space. 
Create some room so that the Holy Spirit can enter your world. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, things change. Power comes. He will give you power. He says, wait for the gift my Father has promised you, which you heard me speak about before. John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. And they waited. And they made space. They made a room. They actually met in a room. And 120 of them were gathered together, waiting, waiting, making space for the Holy Spirit to come. It changed their experience. What would happen in the second part of our year if we made purposely made some time to wait, make some space, take some time, come on Saturday evening for a 7 o'clock prayer, come and pray. I believe we begin to experience the power of God in our lives. The power of the Spirit, His involvement in our lives will have power to live. You guys remember that message that I talked about just a couple weeks ago in James. It says that, that we were finite. We've got to remember, we're finite, but God is infinite. Sometimes we try to plan for the future. It says there, it says in James, it gave him a warning. Some of you guys plan to go to the city and make a profit. And, but God said, don't plan for the future because you can't even make tomorrow happen. We don't know the future, but we can know the source. Let's not forget just how much better it is to have life dependent on God. That's why Jesus said, don't leave. Don't step out. Don't leave this sanctuary. Don't do it without taking a moment and saying, Holy Spirit, I need you. This series this month we're calling The Power for Life has a purpose with it. It is my intention, it is our intention, pastors and I's intention, that I, and us as pastors, are going to personally carve out more time to meet with God. We're going to set aside time in our life. We're going to say, hey God, I'm going to increase my time with you because I want to see you come through. And we're inviting you to do the same. We, our desire is to stir a hunger in our body, in our family, for more of God. Say nothing less but you, God. And I'm praying that the Holy Spirit does it. I can't do, I can't physically stir desire in you. The Holy Spirit can do it. I've been praying, Holy Spirit, stir desire. Bring people who are hungry. Bring who are people who are ready for a change. And I believe that's who he brought this morning. That's who he's going to bring next week. That's who he's going to meet every time we gather together. He's going to bring us together and people that desire him. I want you to go in, into the rest of this year with a recognition that you need His presence and He wants to pour out it into your life. You hear that? It's my heart. That you recognize you need His presence and that He wants to pour it out in your life. So let's take a look at point one. Today. And it's this. I need an experience with the Holy Spirit. Say that with me. I need an experience with the Holy Spirit. This is the first thing that we've got to say. If we're going to be on a journey of power, we want to have power in our life. The first thing that has to be our heart's cry is, I need this. I need this. I need this. Sometimes it's hard for us to be in need. But I'm telling you, this is the most important prayer to pray. God, I need you. I need an experience with the Holy Spirit. Let's just talk a minute about the poster child for transformation. <laughs> you know the poster, there's, a, there's a, a famous person that was transformed by the Holy Spirit. His name is Simon Peter. He was with Jesus. You know that? He walked with Jesus. He was one of those disciples. And he has a great example of how the Holy Spirit can change somebody. Because if you read the history of Jesus, the four Gospels, you know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it tells the story of Jesus. They include records of Simon Peter. And sometimes I, I say Simon Peter had a foot and mouth disease. If you guys have some time, I have that as well. Open mouth, insert foot, you know, I say the wrong thing at the wrong time at this certain moment. Uh, Peter, he had this, he was consistently inconsistent. He would have great revelations and then great oaths. Like, what were you thinking? You had a great, the Holy Spirit just spoke through you, Peter, and now the next moment he's like, Insert foot, insert foot. Basically, Simon Peter, after this moment where he experienced the Holy Spirit, lived out of his own strength. Some of the stuff he offered to God was really great. 
and some of it was really ugly. There was a really ugly moment whenever Jesus was on trial and Simon Peter denies that he even knew Jesus. He denied him three times. I don't even know that guy. No, I wasn't with him. I, I, I'm not, I don't hang out with him. Then, on the moment when he just, we just read, just that moment where the Holy Spirit comes, Jesus said, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised. When he experienced, when Simon Peter experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in his life, he became a totally different guy. He was like, all oh, good. He was like speaking words of wisdom. He was speaking words of truth. He stood up in front of a crowd of a thousand of people, and he spoke boldly. and told them, you guys are the ones that crucified Jesus. Repent now. That's basically the words he said. That's not the guy that was, wouldn't even tell a servant girl that he was associated with Jesus. That's power. That's transformation. That's restoration. That's a difference the Holy Spirit makes in his life. He stood up, he started preaching, 2,000 people got saved. Like that. Difference. He became a powerful leader. Supernatural things began to happen in his life. He became incredibly bold. The same kind of things that he wants to do in our lives. But now I'm just a, I'm an introvert. The Holy Spirit gives you power to be bold. Now, again, I will say, everybody needs to have an experience with the Holy Spirit. And I know the experience, sometimes people, like, you know, they're not, you know, living in Madison, being a science community, maybe we're not always excited about experiences. But our faith leads us to experience the Holy Spirit. He's more than just words on a page. And it will affect who we are. Sometimes it, Maybe you get in worship time and you get a little excited and we get a little loud and, and maybe some people in the room are crying and some people are, are kneeling before the Lord. You see pastor doing that, kneeling before the Lord. It is it, 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 it designed to respond and have the experience in the physical realm. Not just some spiritual hoopla that we're talking about. It's a real thing. And I mean, when people are responding physically and emotionally, it's different, but it's okay. Some things only change when your life it, sorry, some things only change in our life when you have an experience with the power of God. It's very difficult. We see it over and over again as a power. People come in contact with God and the experience of change happens in their life. In fact, there are two primary experiences that everybody needs to have. Let me just tell you about them. The first one that happens is when we get saved. Our life changes because we surrender our life to Jesus Christ. Everyone has come to the point where they recognize that Jesus did for them on the cross. Everybody needs to do this. That he shed his blood for us. That he died for us. That he rose again from the game. Great. Conquering sin in our life. We had a verdict of death. And Jesus conquered. He gave life to us. When we put our faith in Jesus, not only are our sins forgiven, but his Holy Spirit takes up residency in us. Did you know that? When I say, Jesus, I surrender to you, forgive me of my sins, I, I desire that you be the Lord of my life, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit takes up residency in our lives. This happened to the disciples in John chapter 20. In this moment, there was a moment in John chapter 20 that there, there records the very first moment when the Holy Spirit entered somebody. <laughs> See, up to this point, up to the point that Jesus conquered death and the grave, the Holy Spirit operated in the world around us. But he never lived in anybody because it wasn't possible yet. Sin was still in the way. It wasn't possible for a Holy Spirit to live in a broken body. After Jesus rose from the grave, he removed the barrier of sin in our lives. And he steps into the room where his disciples are in his resurrection form, and Jesus shows up in the room where his disciples are, and he says to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, actually, it says that he breathed on them. They received the Holy Spirit. So, for the very first time in human history, human beings now held the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit replaced 
That which was dead, that which was empty on the inside, he replaced it with his presence. The Spirit of God who came inside these disciples, they received the Holy Spirit. When you prayed a prayer and, and you got saved, when you prayed that prayer, when you gave your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit that, that Jesus gave, all of a sudden, inside of you. You received the Holy Spirit. Something happens. Let me ask a question. Has this happened for you? Have you received the Holy Spirit in your life? Have you given your life to Jesus completely? Do you know, do you have a confidence that the Holy Spirit is living inside of you? I hope by the end of the service that you'll have this first experience, the experience of salvation, the experience of surrender, where the Holy Spirit is breathed into you. Now, today, we're also talking about the second experience. The first is the Holy Spirit coming. We know that there is God the Father. He created everything. God the Son, Jesus, He came in the body of Jesus. He walked on earth. He demonstrated Himself. He died on the cross. He rose again. He's now sitting on the right hand of the Father. And also, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. All God, three persons, in one being. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of every believer. God Himself, He takes up residency inside of us that have put our faith in Him. God Himself lives inside of us for every person that confesses Jesus as Christ. That's the first experience. But beyond that, there's a second experience. The disciples had to wait for it. Jesus said that we've got it. But now in Acts 1, he says, Don't leave Jerusalem, because you have received power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Don't really, don't really make room, because there's more. Make room, because there's more. Take time, because there's more. You need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Then you need the Holy Spirit to come upon you <laughs> and overflow you to give you power to begin to live a supernatural life. Being saved and having the Holy Spirit live on the inside of you isn't enough to do the life at the level God wants you to do. Being saved and having the Holy Spirit inside of you is not enough to do life at the level that God has for you. There's a greater thing. There's something beyond what we have. You also need to have this experience with the Holy Spirit that comes on you with power. It begins to transform you. It begins to change you. To be like Him. Maybe you've experienced number two but you've allowed your walk with the Holy Spirit to become a bit dormant. All of us need to be filled, and to be filled ongoing. A renewing. Paul says there wants to be renewed in the Spirit at all times. With a fresh work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Have you had the second moment yet? Have you had the first? I have come to know you, Jesus. Have you had the second? Have you been baptized in the Spirit with power? This question I want to ask, I want you to wonder, maybe you say, I'm not sold on the idea of meeting the experience. Hey, this over the next three weeks we're praying, this is going to happen. Let's illustrate what it's going to be like. We just went through a season going from winter, and, and sometimes really hard. I have, I have beautiful windows where I, I work, All the whole building is lined with windows, and I get to look out here in wintertime. Anybody look out here in wintertime out the window? It looks like this it's dark, it's brown. The trees, they don't have green on them. It's just twigs like waving in the wind. It's just nasty, right? But what happens? Anybody, anybody, anybody experience this? I mean, I went, I went on vacation for a week. I came back all of a sudden, boom, every, all the trees are just like, great life flowing through them. I mean, these, all these Different, uh, I don't, are they irises out there? These little yellow irises that popped out of the ground and exploded with light. It happens, you can see that transition of a buzz kind of all of a sudden. But uh, the, the, what happened to them? Did birds come along and start hanging green things on the tree? I don't see, I, I know around Christmas time we bring out lights and we hang out lights, right? 
They did all our neighborhoods. Did you see in the neighborhood all of a sudden the the uh, the people get out? All right, it's time to hang the leaves up, right? I don't want to hang my leaves up. No, it didn't, it didn't happen, right? It's actually from within them that life sprang out, right? And, and, and we know a little bit about biology and then all these other right? You know, biology that's study of human. But anyway, um, it, all of a sudden the the sap, the power was already within the tree. And at the right time, all of the sap begin to go through the tree and bring life to the whole tree. And all of a sudden, now leaves begin to spring out, flowers begin to bloom, fruit, all the fruit trees are starting to come out. I was just at my sister's house, and she has a little blackberry bush out front now, and the little fruit are coming out. Right? Everything's, it, uh, the power to bring life was already contained within them. The power for life is already contained within you. It's the Holy Spirit. There are some things that only happen through life with direct experience with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is a person. Jesus and Christianity, it isn't just a philosophy, it just isn't a mind game. It's not a set of principles, it's not a ritual, it's not a routine. It's a relationship with a real person. You can't get in a relationship with a real person, especially someone as powerful as him, without being changed. You ever meet people that are just power, they just energized to do wow, it's exciting to be around them, and when you're around them and it changes it. You can't be around the Holy Spirit, he's a person, you can't be around him without being changed. We want to, and sometimes in our life, depersonalize, de-emotionalize, de-experientialize Christianity to make it safe, to make it contained. Something we can think about. I like to think about things. But God's saying, no, there's more. I want you to dip you, I want to dip you into the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to fill your life with joy and so much more. I want to dip you in the power. I want you to have authority. I want you to have supernatural demonstrations in your life. And these are things only you can do. That many times in our lives, we want to overcome the things around us in our own strength. God says, I have the power. I have the power to change. Second point is I need the explosiveness of the Holy Spirit. I need an experience with the Holy Spirit. I need, an ex I need the explosiveness of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. You will receive power. The word power there is dynamite. You receive dynamite power. Anybody see that stick dynamite go off? Everything in the general vicinity of dynamite changes. Right? You can't change. You can't not change. I need the explosive power of the Holy Spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. It's a life altering, and it's a little bit like riding a wave. The force it carries is it's powerful. It's good. It's all good, but it's powerful. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. See, a lot of times when we think about these branches, we think about our life. John chapter 15 talks about us being branches and we're connected to a source. But many times in our life, we want to change the circumstances around us instead of relying on the source that's within us. So we pray these prayers. We say, God, would you just change the circumstances? Would you change the things that are going on around me? Would you make it easier for me? Uh, these struggles that I've had, would you, would you change it? He, he, he's saying, it's not the outside that needs to be changed. It's the inside that needs to be changed. Remember the trees that we just saw, they, wasn't, they didn't get, people didn't, sometimes, you know, honestly, sometimes I want to just duct tape good things around me, right? I want to take duct tape and you're like, all right, change this thing around me. I want, to, I want to bring something better into my life. I want to adapt this thing. I want to add on to my life, and I'm adding on to my life, and I'm caring. And then the thing that I wanted to change in my life, then I add all these things, and that becomes burdensome on me. I said, stop duct taping things to you. It doesn't happen that way. 
happens when we desire to have an experience with God, we seek Him, and we go after the explosive power of the Holy Spirit that's already within us, and it changes us from the inside out. And then from the inside of us, everything around us is transformed. Here's the deal. When God operates in the world, He does not primarily work just to, just to alter our circumstances on the outside. He does do that. He does intervene. But He does things for that will be done Sorry, so, sorry, the things that he's going to be doing in our life, the primary way of operation, the primary way that he's going to accomplish these things is to do it inside of us. The Holy Spirit is working in you to birth the things that need to happen in your life. And they're going to affect your life in a positive way. I desire for us to remove the outward things that we try to hold on to and to experience the Holy Spirit in an explosive way so that the world around us becomes different. A living, vital relation with the person of the Holy Spirit is the only way that God has called us to do so. That leads us to, to my last point, that we need to have an expectation of the Holy Spirit. First, we recognize our need for Him. Secondly, we, we desire an explosive relationship. And third, we have to have an expectation of the Holy Spirit. I'm tired of going to my Word in the morning, just reading words on the page. I'm tired of coming on a Wednesday night for missional community and just experiencing good fellowship. I'm tired of coming on Sunday morning and just making sure I got that check mark off. We have to come with an expectation of the Holy Spirit. He wants to do this in us. He wants to change us. He wants to change you. He wants to change you. He wants to change you. He wants to change us. And inside of us, some of us are excited. Some of us are shouting, yes. Yes, Holy Spirit, do this. Yes, I know you can do it. Are you getting, getting ready for the You want this. You can't wait for it to happen. And I just want you to know how much God wants it for our future, too. God wants us to get a hold of Him. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. It's going to take a risk, but we've got to have a heart to pray. God, I'm willing to take the risk. Okay, Holy Spirit, would you just do this in my life? I'm open to you. I want you to do this in me. And he will. He'll do it. He'll do it because he promised, he is the promised Holy Spirit. The, the power of God is promised for us. They were gathered together in the upper room and they were praying and they were seeking him and they were expecting that God would do something. And guess what? We have to get it in our hearts. And, hey God, I'm expecting you. I want you to do this. It's going to take a risk. Maybe I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't even know all the, the ins and outs of it. But Holy Spirit, I want it. to conclude with this. The day of Pentecost, it was a feast. And there, there was gathered 120 people in the upper room, and they were waiting, they were following the command of Jesus to wait, to make space. I want to encourage you, this 120 people, it wasn't, it wasn't just for the pastors. That's why I, I tell people, don't call me pastor, I'm just an ordinary person. Just get to speak every once in a while. They were just ordinary people hanging out together. They weren't super Christian. They weren't pastors. They weren't ministers. They definitely weren't perfect. These were guys just like us. These were ladies and women. These were mothers and, and daughters. These were fathers and sons. They were gathered together, 120 of them. But this is what was true of them. They were hungry for God. They were expecting God. Jesus told me to wait. He told me to wait for something. He told me there's going to see something coming. I'm expecting it. When is it going to happen? I want it. I want it. I need 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 it. They were there. 
It's for everybody. It's for the seasoned Christians. It's for the new Christians. It's for the skeptical person. It's for the person that's just checking out the Holy Spirit. It's for everybody. And so I want to challenge us with this. One, I challenged us, read one chapter a day this month. I want to challenge us also with this. I want to challenge us with a fast. I don't know if you've ever fasted before, but part of fasting is when you, you give up something, uh, you give up something that's very good for you, you give up a meal, a meal of flesh. And, and I don't know about you guys, I love to eat, so when I, when I don't eat, I get hungry. And that hunger reminds me of my need for physical food. And fasting, that hunger reminds me, and I say, God, just as I'm hungry for food, God, may I be hungry for you. God, just as I know a filet mignon, or if you're a vegetarian, maybe a great, a, a, a great canoe dish with squash, and, you know, I know that will satisfy my hunger enough, but God, I want to be satisfied by you. And so during a season of fasting, my hunger for physical food changes from my hunger for you. And the time that I would regularly spend eating, or the time I would regularly spend, if you want to fast and say, for, for 24 hours, I'm, I'm not going to watch any TV or television, and instead I'm going to spend that time with God, is because uh, my desire is, I don't know about you, but I like to turn on the TV and relax. I was relaxing. Relax if I just spent some time with TV. And, and I believe it's okay to, to relax a little but in a fast, I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to put away my regular time of relaxing, and I'm going to relax in your presence. I'm going to feed my spirit in this moment. So I'm going to challenge us. Wednesday, we meet for missional communities, and we eat dinner together. So after dinner, Wednesday, till dinner on Thursday, it's not quite 24 hours. So it's going to be breakfast for, for Thursday morning and lunch for Thursday morning. Let's go without food. Challenge you. If you have some medical things, you know, you be wise with that. Go without food so that we can go after God. We'll get back on Sunday, we're going to talk about, hey, how awesome God did, what God spoke to us like that. But for 24 hours, from dinner Wednesday evening till dinner Thursday evening, let's seek God. As pastors, we're going to be doing that, seeking God, praying, getting in His Word, reading that chapter for the day, asking God, how would... What do you have for me? What is your desire for me? God, I, I want you. Can we do this together? A 24 hour fast. So, so the two challenges for pastor read a chapter a day in Acts, and two, do a 24 hour fast. I want to choose to fast food. And during the time that I would normally eat, I'm going to spend in this work just praying, asking God, God, I desire you. I desire you. Let's take a moment and pray.